Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And tonight, I'm really honored and really excited to be speaking to Rabbi Simcha Weinstein. If there are topics you want to hear, if you have any comments, anything, please reach out to us at health at JOMA.org, H-E-A-L-T-H at JOMA.org. We want to hear from you. Rabbi Simcha Weinstein is a best-selling author, syndicated columnist, and family peer advocate at Families Together in New York State. He serves on the Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, or DDPC, a federally funded New York State agency working under the direction of the governor. He is the chair of the Religious Affairs Committee at the Pratt Institute and founder of the Jewish Autism Network. Please check the show notes for multiple links to articles he has written and some webinars. Welcome, Rabbi Simcha. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Minkin. Okay, then. (laughs) You got me back. You did tell me off (laughs) uh, This was a conversation amongst parents, so. Exactly, exactly. And I've been waiting and waiting to meet a dadvocate like you. Thank you. I never heard that term. I really like it a lot. And I, I can say I've interviewed other parents, but they've all been moms. And so you are unusual. And so I'd love to hear more about your journey, please. You know, the bar does seem to be low for the dad. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't want to dwell on gender stereotypes, but it seems to be vulnerability and, and machismo uh, don't seem to to max and I to mix. And I have noticed along my journey that no one really seems to ask the dads, how are you feeling uh, with all of this? So I guess my, my journey to dad advocacy really... Um, began when when our our second oldest son, uh, Ellie, and I'm sort of careful but and sensitive that I'm speaking on his behalf when he would miss milestones. And I, I think uh, I went into uh, the dad in denial. I was, uh, we talk about being family driven in the peer world. I was literally the, uh, the Uber driver. And uh, I, I would say to myself, well, he's going to grow out of this and the doctors don't know what they're talking about present company excluded. Um, and uh, I, it was really, uh, I would say, when, when our son hit, hit puberty, that everything seemed to change in a nanosecond, that we were in the Disney world of early intervention until uh, it was really that, that puberty. And we found ourselves increasingly in crisis situations, excluded from inclusion. Um, uh, programs were less inclined to take him. Um, he was, I guess, no longer small and cute, although I think mm. he's still cute. Because uh, He I'm is. I've seen pictures. He is. I'm a doting <laughs> dad. And, and uh, you know, it got to the point where school would uh, require me to be within a three-block bro- uh, three radius mm. at all times. <laughs> and um, I wrote a very long piece for a Tablet magazine. And this sort of culminated in, in our son uh, spending time in a pediatric psychiatric facility and really for me i would say the shift came um and that was really a, a, another um, a level for us that suddenly you know he's he's taken away and, and he's behind two um uh, fences of barbed wire and 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 my phone mm. was confiscated and the mm. shocker to me was just how many children like our son were sitting in such a facility not uh, sens- uh, sensory appropriate. The doctors had little to no training in autism, and it was just for me. It was astounding uh, that what was av- that when we needed help the most, there was there was really was the least, and that was the moment where I felt I really need to to get involved over here. I felt compelled, and it was really at that moment that I would lean on to other families because, and I've since learned a lot about systems navigating systems advocacy. And uh, it's really at that moment that we, we really were left, uh, I would say, without, without any resources. And I decided that uh, 
once we go through this, I was going to be that that resource so others shouldn't have to go through that that same loneliness. And I suppose- right. Right. I mean, I think just to make it really clear, what you're talking about is that right now we don't really have good resources for kids with severe behavior problems, whether or not they're on the spectrum. It could be other reasons as well, right? Yeah, I think I think um, with autism and, and a higher support uh, individual who mm-hmm. needs those higher supports, I, I think, uh, you know, there is this sort of fallacy that New York State is it's the best. We have the most. Uh, it does uh, we are the best when it comes to early intervention. Mm-hmm. However, when, when kids uh, seem to, to age out and they're no longer kids, uh, that's when I, I really, I felt, I felt the, the deficit. And, and I'm just starting to, uh, to experience as I'm growing in advocacy, it's called falling off a cliff, mm-hmm. uh, which is the post-21 uh, uh, experience. So um, yeah, I felt that it was something, I felt compelled. And, and as, as a rabbi, I almost felt uh, it was a calling to a, a new a new ministry for me. So when you say ministry, what does that mean? What do you do? Uh, what, what, <laughs> what do you do all day? <laughs> what do I do? You. Um, so so really, it was really it, it began for me uh, in terms of navigating that that, that crisis um, uh, puberty period, uh, the process that we went through with a residential schooling. And that really put me into the world of, of advocacy because it was really, as I said, when we needed help the most, there was the least. It was other parents that, that I would lean on. And I actually took some training to become a, a family peer advocate. And um, that led to me being asked to become a trainer of, of other peer family advocates as there seems to be so few uh, dads uh, in, in, the, uh, in the peer world. So I'm now a trainer. I work with a policy initiative in Albany called Families Together, New York State, who are the voice of lived experience within our systems of care. And, and the idea behind that is that, you know, just like uh, I would say, uh, uh, like yourself, a medical professional has their own body of work and a, and a provider has a body of knowledge, but so too a family has an understanding outside the scope of, of that provider. And it's that lived experience. A family is an expert on their own life, symptoms and strengths. And uh, just like uh, the scientific knowledge has power, so too the personal history. So we've been able to help sort of form our systems of care from a family perspective. So really we, we um, host town halls with, with um, commissioners of different systems of different committees uh, within the legislature. And uh, that's, I'm in Albany now, I would say at least once a month. So for me, it really wow. has become, it's become a calling. It's become, it's become a passion. And I've also you know, been able to sort of uh, connect with so many parents from within my community. I felt that I could perhaps evoke the most change locally, but also uh, outside of my community. I've become uh, aligned with, with a whole number of, of grassroots uh, advocacy um, organizations. Right. I really want to talk more about that. I don't want to overwhelm people, though, because I really feel like being a parent today is hard. Being a parent of a yeah. child with special needs is like that on steroids. And asking any more from us is asking too much, to be honest. We have to be grateful to people like you that go above and beyond. But the point of this podcast is not to tell everybody to to be you. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's what I think. I mean, just to to learn more about it. But I think that I think also that the personal is political. Right. Like when you fight for your own child, which is what your job is anyway, no one will advocate for your child like you will. You're still helping make change. And so I do want people to learn from your experiences about how to do that, because that that we have to do. Well, I, I would say to go back to the first uh, the advocacy that we spoke about, that, that mm-hmm. for me, it really was that shift from dad in denial initially. And I think that denial has its place. The brain protects us from that right. which is awkward. Uh, however, you know, denial is the first uh, step towards acceptance. And it was really that acceptance. And I would say where I've gone, uh, I, I think above and beyond, is, is, is to really not just accept, but, but embrace. And for me, it's become, it's become a community of, of advocacy. And, and I've also actually sort of wrestled with my own, I guess, uh, neurodivergence. I was mm-hmm. diagnosed late in life with ADHD. Apparently, I'm the only one. 
that never knew this because whoever I tell, they seem to say, wait, wait a minute, nobody told you. I'm like, no, nope, nobody told me. So I guess, Doc, Dr. Minkin, there's a reason why I once picked up the wrong kid from preschool. Um, that happened, so I'm going to own it. And uh, it's it's for me, it's been, I, I would say, an adventure. It's fun. It's not like I don't look at this as as a burden. I look at it as, as a blessing. I look at this as as an opportunity. And I think when it comes to family advocacy, it's it's really as little or as much as one would like to to engage in. Right. Right. Whatever you do, you're making the world a better place, not just for your own child, but for others. You're paving the way. So I mean, I what, could, what could be more fun than making the world a better place? So to go into to, to Albany and to fight the good fight and, and to be involved and to have, I think, I think our community has really, I think, in many ways, really led the way in terms of 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 infrastructure, services and supports. But, but I do think that uh, this is really, you know, it's an evolution, not a revolution. I think we are perhaps lacking when it comes to having a family-driven uh, approach mm. to services. I think families need um, perhaps a voice and a choice, family members to sit on boards and to be active in organizations that speak on our behalf, even with the best intentions as as undoubtedly they have. And really it's by utilizing that family voice and, and also not to uh, sideline the self-advocate who themselves, I think, really, um, that's something that I've learned. I've wrestled with perhaps my own inner ableism. I wasn't even aware of these concepts. Just mm -hmm. the, the idea of speaking about somebody in front of somebody right. is, is problematic. And I've learned a lot about self advocates and I've really evolved as as a as a human so I think there is there is room to to grow I think you know really uh this is I think we're just we're evolving as as a community and as a country in, in right. areas of inclusion right and and it is important to understand that just because someone is nonverbal doesn't mean they have nothing to say yeah yeah. Right. And there are ways to get their viewpoints and it's really, oh. really important to do that. Yeah. But um, there are people who are more able to articulate their needs than others. Right. And so sometimes you do have to do more of the advocacy. Sometimes the parent right. does so have to do more I, of the work. I learned where, where my lane is. And I think for a hot second, I thought, well, I'm going to become some sort of influencer in this area. And and I'll become sort of, uh, and I think that is, I, I've noticed, uh, you know, within within the community of self advocates and parents, there is there is a sort of a tension around. I think what what is termed as the, I guess the quote unquote, uh, mommy or, or, or daddy, um, autism dad, autism mom. And, you know, I I am not autistic. I've not been diagnosed. My role is a parent advocate, and I think all parents like to show their kids off. I don't think it's you know, unique or germane to, to, to autism. I think that's just a, a cringe parent, but we do have to be careful as our kids get older, how we frame them, how we photograph them. I think right. that's something as a community that we could sort of learn to, to be more mindful of. That it's sometimes a tendency to look at a disabled person as inspirational mm. for something that is very regular. They're not inspirational. And I think also um, me, myself, you know, people call me brave, which I find a little bit also ableist. I'm not brave when you don't have a choice. Right. I'm just stepping up and being a dad. And I think my role as a sort of dad advocate is that is that my, my son is higher supports and requires a, a, I guess, a layer of third party support for him to experience happiness, which is, quite frankly, the only thing I want happiness through independence and autonomy. So my job is to make sure others do their job. And, right. and, and I'm going to be involved, you know, just as a self-advocate, we'll talk about nothing about us without, without us. us. And, and I think that's a powerful and, and very truthful. But at the same time, I, I would say when it comes to services and supports, if, 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 if for example, um, you know, my son, uh, when he graduates residential school, he's I, I I would presume be living in a group home situation, and I would argue in in that 
setting, it's also nothing about us without us because I'm going to really be on their case and up in their face to make sure he has you know what he needs and and he's he's well looked after. Right. How old is your son now? He is 18. So I'm sort of kicking the can down the road with the 21 plus off a cliff situation. Um, it's working out pretty good so far. Right. You have some time. Yeah. You have but some it's time. It's in the back of my mind. I'm, Right. And I think it's important for parents not to wait to the last minute. I think it's so terrifying. There's a tendency to try to wait to the last minute. There's a whole concept of transition planning. (laughs) And and you're not supposed to do that. Um, But it it does feel overwhelming. You mentioned before the cliff and we didn't really explain what we meant by that. So maybe you should. (laughs) So I guess guess the cliff is that as, 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 um, as, as our young adults age out of DOE and CSE settings, they fall under the purview of OPWDD, lots of O's, lots of acronyms. This is the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. And, and uh, that is, I, 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 from, it seems to me from the advocacy world, less well-funded. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, um, the workers don't seem to make the types of salaries that are given to early intervention employees. I think the workers... Um, the DSP workers, direct service professionals, are, are very often paid less than less than McDonald's. So it's uh, it's it's not an easy situation. It's it's hard to find those workers, and and uh, that's it's really uh, I, I've heard many many uh, stories of 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 neglect, and and uh, families are I guess um, they're concerned. Right. And the newer model they're pushing is the self-direction model, which, as I understand, it is meant to be like, you know, directed by the person as much as possible. Nothing, you know, for me, without me, which is lovely. Right. I like that part of that. Right. Right. But talk about kicking the can down the road. Who's in charge of that? Who becomes the institution? You. Right. I would also argue that that I'm certainly not... uh... I, I, when it comes to, to providers, we love our providers. We love our, you know, we love our DSP workers. In fact, as in the in the family advocacy world, and that's where I see my lane as as a family advocate. You know, we want uh, our DSP workers to be paid as much as right. our our nurses. So right. we go, we rally. You know, we 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 push. Um, we, you know, because their success is is really our success. So it's really it's. It's it's a partnership amongst parents and and providers. Um, yeah, right. And that's an advantage of the parents advocating too, right? Is advocating right. for better fit pay for the DSPs. Right, right, very much. But yeah. you mentioned before that that the DSPs do have a place at the advocacy table more so than the parents and people with disabilities. It's it's a I would say I would say it's a partnership, and um, it's it's. Uh, I would also do something else I'd like to talk about is that, that my, I, as, as I began, you know, really my, my advocacy started, I wrote a very long piece um, for Tablet Magazine about our, our journey. And I just, I just sort of put it all out there. I just, you know, put it out. It's a three and a half thousand word article. And I just, I, I wanted others because I was actually talking to one of my rabbis in Israel about what we had experienced in a crisis setting. And my rabbi said to me, what are you talking about? You're in New York. New York's got it all. <clears throat> he didn't. And, and he's a wonderful rabbi. He's my best. So he, he I, I just felt like I, I wanted this to, to get more, more coverage. And I wasn't really expecting what would happen next, which was the article sort of blew up. And, and, and it, it, I guess, what do they call it? Viral. Um, right. I'm, I'm going to link it, by the way. I'm going to link it in the show notes. So I, I was I was getting and then suddenly I I I, I really became a, a bit of a spokesman for for this advocacy. I've been to Albany, as I said, I've given testimony in in Albany, and I've become quite connected with with uh, various political figures that sit on the disability committees, and that led me to connect with um, the OPWDD at, at a, I guess a, a higher level, at a commissioner level. And and I will say I've I've really you know been very touched by by the the openness uh, of the systems to listen to to families to to understand and and to really um, seek change. 
Right. I don't know if you want to go into a little bit of what the gaps were that you found out when you went through this with your son in terms of, we talked a little bit about falling off the cliff, but we're talking earlier in terms of kids with more severe behavioral issues, more intensive support needs in terms of what's yeah, out so, there. So I found, I mean, I think also um, this really goes, it's, it's, you know, while he's not a, 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 a you know, you, you don't, you don't become a little or, or, a, or a lot autistic. It is, it is a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it is a spectrum, but, but right. uh, you know, even, even a lower support individual can, can have a, a meltdown and, mm-hmm. and really have um, very, very real needs. And I, I found a few, a few, some of the, the issues that I found was that um, when it comes to a cross system crisis, for example, someone with, with a disability is, is more likely to have a, a mental health challenges anxiety is is uh, much more prevalent uh, in, in the autism community uh, in the neurodivergent community and that when one experiences extreme anxiety they can find themselves in in a mental health setting i didn't realize at the time mm-hmm. that once one steps foot into a mental health setting he's no longer or she is no longer uh, eligible for a disability um, um, services so at the very moment that I needed case management, I suddenly found myself without case management. And then the, the mental health setting, the Office of Mental Health, doesn't always have the sensibility around disability. And it's really, um, it, it's, it's, you, you become sort of in systems limbo, so something that right. I've been really pushing. And this comes from just lived experience, just being in in these settings, meeting families, is there is this, I believe, fallacy around what is called um, cross systems when when a, an individual crosses systems where I believe we should be talking more about comorbidity. Mm-hmm. That it is, you know, why should the, the, the mental health of a disabled uh, person be any less in, important than, than, a, than, than anybody else? Right. So, Just to make it clear, the, the OMH is the Office of Mental Health, the OPWD yes. is Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, as if you can't have both, but many right. people do have both. Right. The same thing has happened, by the way, with substance abuse and mental health. Right. And a woman made a organization in memory of her son who, who passed away from a, an overdose and had been struggling with both comorbidity, you know, coexisting right. disorders. She founded a whole organization. She goes into high schools. And tries to help, you know, with that particular issue. So it's the same problem. Our systems are not working together. I believe I met that lady on a town hall. She's very, oh. very passionate. Um, wow. I yeah, wanted to interview yeah. her, but she was too busy. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out. But but uh, yeah, certainly in terms of, of the comorbidity, the impulse control, that, that right. something like uh, autism. And I've heard this from various systems. When I, when I get sort of up the chain, they tell me, well, you know, we're doing a terrible job on autism. I'm like, well, that's great. Um, that that uh, autism does tend to to bleed into into addiction, uh, right. into into substance abuse, into into mental health. And uh, right. I actually have an article right now on on the behavioral health website, which is the number one trending article, which dealt with um, the, the governor, who I think has shown incredible um, support to youth mental health was on a um, went around the state on a youth mental health listening tour which culminated in a summit in the javits center with a thousand professionals and i thought it was telling that uh, the listening tour um i don't think the governor met a single disabled youth and mm. it did, and and the comorbidity of of a disabled youth did not make it into a single conversation at the mental health summit so I, I think that our systems are siloed. I think that uh, we see um, disability being one silo, mental health being one silo, as opposed to talking about things holistically and, and, uh, and comorbidity. Right. That was also a fantastic article. Also getting linked. Don't worry. I'm Thank on you. it. I'm Good. on it. Good. So you're right. These, these, are, these are big, big problems. and. Yes. As an individual, we, we can only try to work with when the siloed systems as they are, but from an advocacy standpoint, you can do more. Right. I, I, I think hope. I can do more because I'm not coming at this as a provider. So mm. I'm not just, I'm not just a, a guess, a provider of, of a defined service. Mm. I am a family member who's navigating 
the totality of of the systems of care. So I'm just calling it the way that I see it. And I have noticed that in the advocacy world, when I just talk as a dad, and I just, I'm just honest, I'm, I'm just a dad, people are very open to having, um, I, I would say, um, very in-house conversations, very open conversations, and very candid conversations. Because I'm just, I'm just a dad, just trying to understand this. And right, the system hasn't been, been set anyone. up to ruin us, right? It's not set up that way. No. Intentionally. No, no, no. So what are and, some solutions? I, I, I want I solutions. I also, we also look back at sort of Willowbrook as being like sort of mm. this market in the sand that when we're post Willowbrook, right. so everything's good. Uh, and a self-advocate mm-hmm. explained to me, uh, I thought this was very, uh, it gave me a very profound insight. He said he sees autism uh, rights, services, and supports as something akin to feminism in the early 20s, meaning that there's a long way to go. So just because we're no longer at Willowbrook doesn't right. mean we're, we're in the promised land. So right. there, there is, I think there's a long way to go. Yeah. Right. Back to Willowbrook, right? Um, that's why we had deinstitutionalization. The problem is we never built up our communities. Right. 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 Like you can leave the dark ages, but you have to go somewhere better. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. And they really, that was the genesis of me, this, this, this advocacy and, and, and just, the, I guess the dad advocating and that lens learning the parent um, advocate lens that led me to founding the Jewish autism network where I could sort of um, evoke change within my own community. And, and I, I just like p- parents, have reached out to me from all over the world, really. And, and it's given me a good gauge into where we're holding as in, in our community and also in, in systems. Can you talk more about that organization, please? Yeah, so it really, it just, it, it literally, you know, grew out of, of, of our, our situation and the families that helped us and the need to kind of pay that forward and help and help others. And it, it led me to really become aligned with, with the self-advocates who have changed the way I think about myself, my son, my world. Uh, we now have a series of affinity spaces, which are curated by actually autistic individuals, mm. for autistic individuals to discuss a, 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 um, how they, they feel about their, their themselves, their, their community in a neuro-affirming environment. And then also really that, that advocacy within my own community. And as a campus rabbi, I was really honored over the summer to be asked by Chabad on campus to address all of the rabbis about how to make their campus more inclusive. Wow. And we had a very candid conversation. And, and because I have that lived experience, and because I've been a little more, I guess, unvarnished about my own journey, I think it, 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 it opened a lot. And I was surprised how many of the rabbis themselves came over to me personally after, after that lecture. So really, I, I think I've been able to change things on a communal level. Um, also, in, in terms of schools, I find that very often uh, the schools will, I, I think, require a student to become like everybody else in the class, which leads to that that masking. So something that I try to promote is a neuro-affirming environment where we should be right for them. They don't have to be right for us. Absolutely. If and, and somebody one, likes to stim, let them stim. Right, right. One in five people are neurodiverse by definition, at right. least. Right? right. I mean, if we don't get so <clears throat> stuck on who's neurodiverse and who's neurotypical, because there's no sharp line in the sand. Right. right? That concept of neurodiversity, you know, there's neurodivergence and there's neurodiversity. I like the idea of neurodiversity even better because it's not as rigid. It's right. not, you know, us versus them. It's that there's all kinds of ways to have brains. There's all kinds of ways right. to think. And it's not a good way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have developed as, as a Chabad rabbi, I have a very finely tuned Judah, and I can I can snip out the Yidden uh, very easily. But I've also kind of I think I've got now like a sort of a neuro uh, I guess diverse radar now where I can sort of just 
feel it and right. I'm attuned to it. And I think uh, you know, it sort of bounce, we kind of bounce off each other a little bit. Right. What a boring world it would be if everybody was the same. Oh, terrible. Right? So this you, whole concept you, of you. masking to try to be some, you know, right. uniform standard normie, right? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, neuroaffirming, meaning, you know, all brains are good. All brains belong. Right. Let's include them all. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great message that, that the neurodiversity, neurodivergence movement is bringing to us. Right. Yes. So yes. totally, totally into that. No, I, I, go- I, 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 it's, it's, it's changed. Uh, you know, it really has changed me as a person. However, I, I would also argue with, 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 with my son, who is a higher support needs uh, a young man, that a deficit of ability is by definition a disability. Right. And that right. shouldn't be a, a, a dirty word. I, I don't think that uh, makes him any lesser of, of a human being, um, God forbid. However, it means that he does need these services and supports, and, and that's something that needs to be acknowledged and, and discussed. I'm really glad you said that because I think that one of the criticisms, there's sort of a split between the parents of the kids with higher support needs who may not be verbal and the neurodiversity advocates who often are highly articulate, highly competent and highly verbal, as if there's only two ways to be, right? So I'm really glad that you're pointing that out. I think this is why some people prefer neurodiversity as opposed to neurodivergence, right? Right. It's just a different way of looking at it. It's strength-based, but but on the other hand... You know, we can become almost reverse ableism right, if we right. neglect, you know, the, the needs of, of others. Yeah. Right. I mean, we don't need to if we don't fixate on the us versus them. Right. What are your support needs? Right. right? What are your access needs? As um, there's a, pedi- a pediatrician, a family physician, Dr. Mel Hauser. She has an organization called All Brains Belong Vermont. I interviewed her. She's fantastic. Um, and she calls them access needs. What are your access needs? It doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah, I'm right. actually a big fan of, of the, the commission of OPW, uh, Carrie Neifeld, that doesn't talk about special needs, rather just basic needs, downbeat needs, everyday needs. And it's really the, those practical needs that sometimes uh, as a community, we can, I guess, uh, we can, uh, it's called sort of inspirational or there's that tendency to, to, to I guess, I guess uh, reduce someone to, I guess, more infantile. That a, you know, we talk about this inspirational idea right. of which is, which is, Special. I think, very often coming from a lovely place. It, it you know, it's, it's perhaps needed for fundraising. Um, you know, I'm not naive. The, right. you know, I, do, no. I, I get, I get it, but it also, it feels very icky, and, and it was very telling to me that I have there, there are several young adults in the group homes that I like to take to the movies. I, I, I don't know who gets more out of it, to be honest, because I, I, I love the movies. And um, there's a young lady who tells me she doesn't like to hear the term nebuch. And she was explaining that, you know, in her setting that sometimes she's called nebuch. That's, it, it may be coming from a place of, of, of empathy, sympathy, but this this you know we don't need your sympathy we just need your support right i mean i think our communities have come a long way yes. i never want to underestimate how far that we have oh. come yeah right and we're doing more inclusion programs as opposed to programs where we just put you know the special needs kid on a pedestal right, right? we've come a long way but we still have a long way to go yeah no, i know i i think in in some ways that, that uh, i think the more orthodox community is is way I think ahead in terms mm-hmm. of practical um, accessibility. However, we can, and this is not necessarily a, a, a disability um, a related issue. I think we can be a little blunt. Sometimes we lack that sensitivity. There's mm-hmm. there's the tactless element uh, as opposed to maybe that more um, sensitive uh, side. We do need both, but uh, I think uh, my so who ikka. So I am very grateful to uh, the strides that our community has made. Right. I want to get to the point where it's not us versus them. Right. It's all of us. Right. right? How can we incorporate every single person into our community so that they can be fully members of the community? Right. Fully respected, include, fully members. Yeah, we have to include the opinions of, of, of disabled people in, in decisions um, that, that affect them. Sometimes right. we don't, or sometimes I haven't done that. So I'm, I'm, I, these are things that I've learned and and I'm sort of at the epicenter uh, of 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 these things. So so it is 
it, it is very much it's it's uh, an evolution and there can be that tendency to sensationalize and uh, you know people tell me uh, you know isn't he cute you know my son he's cute but he's not that cute you know he's all my kids are cute so uh you know i i uh, I, I, I sort of like uh he's He's, uh, you know, he's, he's no more special than any of my children. Right. But then, you know, when you say cute and then they get older and they're really not right. cute. Right. And right. then what? Right. Talk yeah. about falling off a cliff. You fall off that's a cute it. cliff. Yeah. 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 So that's also, it has to be that our adult children are also part of the community just right. as much as anybody else. Yes. And they need to feel empowered and involved. And I think we need to sort of maybe move beyond what's called uh, awareness into something that is more equal to accessibility. And sometimes it can, and this I think is kind of that evolution uh, that, that I was talking about. Um, sometimes it feels like everyone I know is, is wearing Lycra um, performing a triathlon in the name of awareness about something that I'm very aware of. And <laughs> Enough with the awareness, all right. And you don't want to see me, <laughs> Dr. Lincoln, in, in uh, you know, in uh, yoga pants. Um, I'm telling you, you don't want to see me. It's not pretty in Lycra, but but it's it's it's. I, I think what we I, I think we need to move more to the the accessibility side, right. and I think we are something that 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 and another area is in terms of shidduchim relationships, dating. It's it's an area that I don't think gets the attention that that it deserves. Um, yeah, that's what, one of many areas. Right, and again, but to be treated evolving. like like a unique person, you are not just here's one disabled person. Let's match them up with another disabled person. Right, something more more curated, and and yeah, yeah. Thought people out. are trying. I mean, some people may yeah. be very successful. I, we're not here to criticize. We are here to be positive and move forward. No, there's there's a lot going on. It's, yeah. it's I, I kind there of is. like I I really do feel like like there is like. Maybe I feel it more because I'm I'm sort of you know really immersed, but I, I see change going on all around all the time. No, this is not a I, I'm not looking to 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 critique. No, quite the opposite. I'm I, I'm looking to become a, a really a, a change agent. Yeah, and speaking of community organizations, I will put a plug in for Friendship Circle. Okay, <laughs> so my community West Hempstead had the I think the thirteenth Friendship Circle ever. I helped found it. So I'm very, you know, protective of it. Yeah. Um, it's fantastic because it really is inclusive. My yes. daughter was a volunteer. She got volunteers, my daughter with autism, but she also became a volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. And no, the I, programs I, were I, really I inclusive. Last summer, talking about an inclusive environment in Camp Cayley. And mm -hmm. what an incredible right. camp. I mean, what absolutely phenomenal. And to the point where that my wife went back to, to volunteer as, as the baker. And who knew my wife could be a baker? Just say it. Side note. <laughs> now when she comes home. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. You know she bakes. <laughs> yes. So there is, there's, there is a lot. I, I, you know, I'm extremely proud of, of my community. Right. And I, I make a point when, when, when I'm sort of in, in the, I'm sorry, when, when I'm in, you know, in and around OPWDD to really sing uh, the praises because there, there, there's, there's a lot going on. A lot. Yeah. Right. But you know, it's still, it's so hard to be a parent because we're going to go back to the services. I mean, however much you, you try to include somebody in the community, at the end of the day, they need a setting, they need supports. And it's, that's really hard. What, what does it mean to be a peer advocate? Can you tell me more about that? Because we kind of glossed over that. Yeah, sure. So, so peer, you know, family peer advocate is someone that has lived experience as a parent, foster parent, primary caregiver of a child with social, emotional, behavioral mental health or, or a developmental disability, and they receive a, a, a training course, develop skills and strategies that can help empower and support other families. So really can use that lived experience to, to really to pay it forward. And those tricks and tips that we've had to learn and, and we, we are able to inspire and empower others. So it really is a form of, of coaching. We talk about being strength-based, helping families to, to navigate all of these cross systems because, you know, a peer has had experience on a cross system level, like myself. We've had to deal with CSE, DOE, OMH, OPW. So we're not just 
you know, a siloed lens with someone that's had to really, you know, navigate. Um, and we've we've been, you know, on on the journey, and we've reached some some point of of destination. So it's we help others that are that are at a different point on on that journey. So it's it's, uh, and I'm part of a, a larger peer workforce, which is across the country. There's a peer federation. So it's for me, it's it's like I said, it's almost like a become another a ministry. How do you access a peer advocate? So um, the uh, agencies have, uh, you know, you uh, call up OHEL, um, ask ask for their uh, their local uh, peer, uh, their uh, family peer advocate. I just got a call today from an organization in Williamsburg that is looking to open um, a peer advocate program. It's something that the Office of Mental Health is very um, supportive in it's something they put a lot of resources behind, and um, it's 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 growing. And uh, I would encourage really family members now. If you're looking to uh, get rich, unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, it's it you're not going to get rich becoming a, a uh, an advocate, but it is it it does offer tremendous uh, meaning and purpose. Do you get it's paid at all for it? Do you get paid at all for it, or it's completely volunteer? Yeah, no. If if you it's it, it, it's a professional qualification. Yeah. So I so, actually now I supervise the peers in training. Yeah. And how do you is, become one? So it's it's uh, it's, it's there's a, there's a modules that one takes online. It takes several months, and then there is uh, these modules end with a. Um, there is like a, a a a test at the end of every module, and then there's a there's a, an intensive coaching for four days, and then we have coaching calls where there's also a a a, a, a number of hours. Uh, I believe it's a thousand hours that is it's it's uh, in of in field experience, and then there's a series of coaching calls where the cohort of peers will meet uh, twice a week. And will present cases to the to the trainers. That's great. So you have your lived experience, but you also have training. You have a lot of training. Yes. yes. So how yes. do you access this? Is there a website? Yeah, you can go to Families Together NYS. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Family Together NYS. Yeah. I'm, gonna, yeah. and um, I'm, also... I'm one of the trainers, so I I, I love it. Me That's... and Roselia, who is a legend at the DOE, are are trainers, and we've kind of become a. I guess the odd couple in this. So uh, I think when people sign up, they don't don't expect to see me, but it's really an extension of what I've been doing as a rabbi, as a community leader. And I think that's another area that I'm sort of pushing is is the faith-based peer Mm. support because I did not realize over the years, I look back now how involved I've been within these systems of care that very often, um, perhaps due to, to stigma or just the, the nature of, of our, our communities that, you know, we're very close and tight knit is people will very often turn to their, their rabbi um, or, or their rabbi for, for guidance. So I've really been in that space for many years. So a lot of what I'm doing now is an organic extension uh, of that, especially as a campus rabbi, I've always been a bit of a, I guess, a, mi- a, a middle ground between um, health and counseling with, uh, within student activities, within the student, within ministry. So I think that um, it's it's the rabbis, the ministers, we really have this boots on the ground mm. when it comes to the systems of care, which, why, which is why I think it's important to get some evidence-based training into uh, into our uh, our rabbis, our rabbitsons, our leaders, and I think that's something that you've been at the forefront of. I would hope that one day my little fledgling organization could reach the heights of what you're doing, Doctor Minkin. Oh, Joma, go oh, Joma! Yes. <laughs> I'm a I'm a huge fan. Me too. <laughs> but, but, but there is, I think, somewhat cause for concern in the sense that rabbis may be the first point of contact, but we don't have that evidence-based training, and then systems don't have any experience of rabbis. So I think we do need to come together. There has been work done with the church community out of Mount Sinai, and I think it's it's increasingly, I believe I've been uh, in, in rooms where the commissioner of the Office of Mental Health, has Anne Sullivan, has spoken about this partnership with, with um, clergy 
and and pastorally and and the systems of care. This is very interesting, but maybe some place like OHEL could do that. OHEL yeah. has a lot of different programs going on. Yeah. yeah. Right. But the <clears throat> families together, just to make it really clear, that is a non-sectarian government program? It is, yes, yeah. There is, is a city agency uh, largely funded by the Department of Mental Health that is the voice of lived experience within the systems. So for you me, can... what, mm -hmm. so the, the, what, what got, I mean, for me, I, I, it's not its not a journey I, I sort of was looking for. I just went through this, this crisis situation. I decided to take the training. And um, I guess maybe as a community uh, leader, I'm a shtickle raconteur. I'm good with groups. It's something I've always done that uh, I was I was offered a position and really now what I'm doing is 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 influencing and advising the systems on the very crisis that we experience right. so for me I, I could not be more in, empowered it's something I take very seriously I always take my work home with me so Right. That is really fantastic. And I'm thinking that maybe you would be the one to create a program for the rabbis from this program, right? Yeah, from that no, position we're, we're, that you're that, in. That's something that, that uh, I'm, I'm sort of working on, actually. Yeah. I'm you are to. working on it. Fantastic. Well, watch, watch this space because it's coming. We're looking to actually start like the, some of the affinity spaces that we have now. We're really looking to kind of like um, grow that into something that, that, that could become um, like a teachable, a training assistance to our schools, to our communities, from that, that family lens, from that self-advocate lens, from that um, neuro-affirming lens. Right, so you're talking about not just peer advocates, but peer, there's a word for it when you go out and you become an ambassador, a peer ambassador yes. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so that, and that really is fantastic. this really has in, in me um, joining the, uh, the DDPC, which is the Developmental mm -hmm. Disability Planning Council. So that, that's something that I'm really taking very seriously, that I've been nominated to join the council. I am currently an honorable member in waiting. So because it's a, a government um, position, it, it requires background checks. So I'm, mm. I'm, on, I'm on the list. You're waiting. You're, I'm says... waiting, but there's not, I don't think they're going to, besides a copious amounts of parking tickets um, <laughs> which all the bad rabbis have <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there's very much right so what does this uh council do so this is like has been for me like the real miracle i i, I found myself in through through the um families together work i you know I, I sit on various um think tanks work plans i found myself within uh on a zoom with a gatekeeper uh, in OPWDD, the great Kimberly Berg, who shout out to Dr. Berg, big fan. And um, I, I, we had a very, um, how can I put this, blunt conversation about uh, our journey and, and uh, some of the areas that, that I felt needed um, more care and concern. And when I say blunt, this was about as blunt as blunt uh, could be. I was expecting at any moment, the the, the 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 Zoom to just crash and uh, me to be, uh, I guess, put on the do not return call list. And at the end, Dr. Berg said, great, can you talk to my boss and tell my boss everything you just told me? I'm like, no problem. And, and that that was a real shocker. And that culminated on me, me being uh, invited to join. The, which is, uh, it's called the New York State Developmental Disability Planning Council. It's what do a, they do? What do they so do? This is a federally <laughs> funded, there's a lot of agents, I'm learning, there's a lot right. of agents, and, and, and there's not enough synthesis. So, I, it's something right. I'm so this is a New York State agency working under the behest of the governor. It's federally funded. Every state has a planning council. And what we do is we vote on various grants for, for the um, developmental disability community. So we distribute millions of dollars and we also uh, infuse and inform policy. So it's very much, it's very much the table in Albany. So there is a, a, a cross section of stakeholders that includes uh, parents, 
caregivers, siblings, self-advocates. I believe it's 60% self-advocates, mm. parents, um, siblings, uh, caregivers. And then there is um, uh, members from the systems and and from provider associations. So it's it's really it's really uh, FaceTime in, in Albany at, at, at a very uh, I think uh, what's the word? Uh, it's a, it's the table. So I'm I'm really it's a I, seat I at the to, table. You have a seat at the table. I have a seat at the table finally, uh, and uh, it's I'm taking that very very seriously. That I you know I, I I I'm seeing that as as a representative not just of of my community of 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 various communities and and uh, I, I intend to be pr- uh, pragmatic and uh, at the same time uh, uh, productive and constructive. So I call myself I am a disruptive, constructive change maker. I love it. I love it. I can't wait till you pass through the background. <laughs> yeah. But I already sit in 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 you know quite a few uh, committees <laughs> now. Here. Yeah, it's it's fun. And yeah, for me, it's an honor. It, and, and for I sure, have, no, it's and, amazing. And I stay in my lens as a advocate, and I right. find that when I just have that, you know, like 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 I said right at the beginning, you know, the bar is low for the dads. Nobody else gets a round of applause simply for showing up. Right. So just saying, hey, I'm a dad. And I, I'm just, I'm learning. I'm learning all the time. And it's, believe it or not, it it, it, uh, it sort of opened new doors and avenues as, as a rabbi. So you'd be, you'd be surprised. Uh, you know, I still have the Chabad flavor in me. So so watch out, Albany, because I, I'm, bring, I'm bringing my tefillin. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. I want you to tell me, please, what you think are the most important issues, just a couple of them, that you're hoping to address at this table. I think we, so number one is is the comorbidity, um, not just across systems, something a little more, I, I guess, um, deeper that, that um, I believe, and uh, I'm talking to a doctor right now, so I got to be careful, but I believe that labels are for insurance companies. And human beings are far more complicated right. and we have our, our comorbidities and they should all be sort of recognized and, and understood um, holistically and, and that a disabled individual should be able to cross systems regardless right. of billing codes and case management. Sometimes it feels like there's more case management than cases. Right. And um, I, I, I do see a duplication of resources in this area. I think uh, we need uh, the accessibility is is massive. I think the communication is is massive. Um, housing is something that is. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually yesterday I was at a meeting in in Southampton. Um, very fancy, I will say. I had a meeting with the Greek Orthodox Church to have a very unique model. I believe you mentioned this before for housing that is um, using self direction and mm-hmm. other benefits. With communal support and with and with private sector donations uh, on a very unique model, I was absolutely blown away. I actually met with with delegates from UJA and went out there to see what the Greek Greek Orthodox Church was doing, and who knew? Because uh, I was mm. like, "Wow, um, amazing!" So uh, I think the housing piece um, that'll do for now. I think. Right. The housing piece alone will do for now. But, you know, coming up with creative solutions is going to be really important because we cannot go back to Willowbrook. Right. Right. We cannot go back there. Right. Employment, empowerment and uh, yeah. And leading through choice. And I think that it's important that that self-advocates and families are not appropriated, but we are integrated. Sometimes it can feel like we we don't have um, enough choice and, and voice even as well-meaning as that is and, I'm, I'm, and i really i've I, I i can only talk um with um reverence for what uh our community and other communities are working very hard absolutely absolutely that is so so true what would be a dream accomplishment you know, I think I'm sort of living my dream, to be honest. You already are. You already really, are. I really, I really do. I feel like I'm living my, my dream. I think a dream accomplishment um, 
all right, there is <laughs> there is something I'm working on that would that be a secret? dream accomplishment. <laughs> but I'm going to, uh, it, with with the permission of the doctor, I'm going to let that simmer. Okay. I'm going to revisit this uh, in in a year or so from now, and I'm going to tell you where I'm holding with the dream accomplishment because there is yes. There is something that is, something. is is needed, and and yes, I, I have some partners, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It I'm very excited. Today, I'm on right? hold for that one. I'm putting you on yeah. hold for that one. I'll so tell for you the rest off, of us, okay. podcast. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> I won't tell anyone else. What about for the rest of us? You know, I mean, like I said before, I don't think everybody can do what you do. I don't think that you're really being, you know, you're being humble when you say the bar is so low. You're doing an amazing amount of work there, and you really are very unusual. And I thank you for all that you do for all of us. What about the rest of us? Okay. So I, I, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I guess I'll end off with with one of my advocacy mentors, uh, Jennifer. Um, her name is Jennifer Lazio Mizrahi, founder of Respectability talks about the first, I guess, um, advocate in Judaism was Moses, who went mm. to Pharaoh to demand action. And even though, you know, Moses faced a, a burning bush and had a staff, I think that, uh, you know, we can all uh, have clear goals. We can all, um, I think it's important to, to have a, a vision and a message and not just get hung up in the trauma of navigating systems which is right. it, it can be very traumatic and it, it and 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 um that we need to sort of um have have like a vision and also and also have a, a chaos and a fun because this is fun this is not for, for me it's it's like the fact that i'm able to have conversations with the great dr minkin um you know Erev Shabbos is, <laughs> is, is for me like unbelievable. So I think don't forget to to have fun, to 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 be engaged, to be involved, to meet with other families. And I think it's it's families should should know that that um, that that they are change agents, and that, and that a family does have that your story is is your currency, and mm. that you can take that currency out into the world. And and that you know we may have to roll up our sleeves. Sometimes you know it feels like the IEP meeting can feel like we're going into a boxing ring. But um, to have that sort of that empowerment, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. I think that's very humble. Okay, <laughs> but I'm going to take I'm going to take the idea of that you can get help, you can get support through this peer advocacy, and someday maybe you can pay it forward. Yes. Right. Yeah, and you're you're a child's best advocate. No one can do it like you can. No one understands. Yes, yes, I, I do believe that lived experience is worth a PhD or two, and I think that that, that knowledge, so true. that knowledge that one experiences, you know, in, in and around the kitchen is 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 very valuable. And I and I and I found that even at the highest echelons of of uh, you know our systems of care, they're looking for that knowledge, that 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 knowledge, you know, in and around the kitchen, in in and around the house. It, it is something we've had the New York Times sitting in our house. They wrote a four page wow. article about crisis. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, we've, we've been able to kind of think local, I guess, and, and, and act uh, global. So, That's global. Yeah. I have to thank you so much for doing this thing. I really, really appreciate it. I learned Can a I lot. Can I just say I one thing, Dr. Minkin? Yeah. <laughs> when you reached out to me to do this podcast, I have never experienced such an organized Jewish um, situation in my <laughs> life because somebody <laughs> from your organization said to me are you free in and she gave me a date like like 10 months I'm like, I, don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what i'm doing in 10 minutes <laughs> i was like what the i'm like i guess we book far ahead we book far ahead <laughs> wow the, the level of organization and and follow-up and and just just this this conversation you know we, we've we've become uh, friends so no so for, for me like some of the friendships that, that I've made and I'll, I'll give you one nice example that is a young man from one of the group homes that comes to us every Friday um, he's become almost a Ben bias his mother called me and my wife to tell us you know I want to thank you for having our son over I know that you can never understand what it means to send a son away I said funny you should mm -hmm. say that <laughs> She didn't know anything about our right. 
Funny you should say that. And 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 today, you know, this you know this boy and his father and me, are, we're just besties. So like for me, you know, it's 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 been it's been a lot of fun. It's it's really it's a community, and it's a community that that I'm happy to to be around where we can just share our authentic selves and just speak sort of freely and openly and, and honestly. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's a blessing. It's certainly not a burden. I, I'm certainly not brave. It's absolutely a blessing. And uh, and really, any any families that that you know you are connected with or or hear this podcast. I'll give you my cell phone. No, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> You're not I'm serious. <laughs> you, I, I, you know, I'm very, I'm very transparent. I, 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 my email, info at jewishautismnetwork.com. Yeah, you can do. I, you know, I, I like to have a, a constructive, uh, un, unvarnished conversation. Right. And right. In, okay, I'm sorry, okay info. Now. Wait, I'm going to say that louder. Info at? Jewishautismnetwork.com. Okay. And I think that we have to have some courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. We all have to have some thick skin over here. That's that's where change comes from. And and if there are you know disagreements, it it should be constructive because we ultimately we all want the same thing, which is the health and and happiness uh, for for our youth and our children and our adults. Right. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. We're all in it together, and you don't have to go it alone. Yeah. Those are cliches, but they're true. Yes. So, now I'm going to thank you again. Thank you so, so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Anytime. It's been a, I told you this would fly by. And it, I know, and it, I know. Watch out because I'm getting you again sometime. I don't think we, <laughs> 10 months from now. <laughs> any of the questions you sent me, but uh, yeah, that will be next time. So thank you so much. No, and, my and, and also, you know, Lashana Toba to you. And and to your your wonderful work, and uh, you should only go from strength to strength in in all that you do. Amen, both of us to all of us. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A, dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.